everybody. It's so good to be with you this morning. My name is Steve, if I haven't met you before. I feel like I've met quite a few. Um, welcome to church. As I said, we have got a wonderful morning planned. Uh, we're going to be reading the Bible. We're going to be praying to our loving Father. And we're going to be worshipping Him in spirit and in truth. So why don't you stand with us and we'll start our service. the battle, we won't fear the night, we will walk the valley with you by our side, you will go before us, you will lead the way, we have found a refuge only you can save, sing with joy now, our God is for us, the Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress.
God be exalted. God be exalted. God be exalted in everything. We live for your glory. Live for your glory. Yes, Lord, we pray today that you will be exalted over everything. Over our hearts. Over our minds over our relationships and our jobs and everything that we do during the week, Lord. May you be exalted over all of those things because in your heart we find our treasure. Help us, Lord, to know that. Help us to know that you are ours forevermore.
been and always are and will always be ours forevermore and we can one day live with you in heaven. Please take a seat. Well, welcome to church, everybody. Um, Thanks for coming this morning. It's great to be with you. There are lots of faces that I haven't seen in a while and whether you're returning from um, a break, some holidays, some sporting events or illness, it's really nice to have you um, back here this morning. Um, You'll notice a big gap in the front section here. Our youth have gone straight down to their youth program this morning because it's gate crash tonight and um, we're going to have them in church this evening um, to help them um, learn how to do church every week, which is excellent. Um, Welcome for those online. If um, I haven't met you before, my name's Emily and it will be really nice to chat with you later um, uh, when we do morning tea and coffee after the service. Um, We have a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, Firstly, if you were handed a contact card, looks like this, might have been in your Bible or you can follow the link online, we'd love for you to fill it in so we can get to know you a little bit better and find out how we can best um, welcome you into our community. There's also a spot which you can do by following the link but also on the back of the contact card is write any special prayer requests and they can go confidentially to our pastoral team as well if you would like prayer for any areas. Now, there are a couple of good things coming up in our church, one for women and one for men. The first one, um, Wednesday week, we've got Women's Night Chapel. It happens once a term and is a really great way for um, women to get together and do church in the evening. We have supper beforehand and we we, um, hear from a nice woman in our community. And uh, it's a really great opportunity to invite uh, a friend of the women variety um, to, to come and, um, and spend that time together. Um, if you want more info about that, please head to our website or up the back we have an info hub. If you haven't noticed, we have a lot of pamphlets um, on a bookcase style thing just near the door too, which is also where you can find out about our men's breakfast, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. There's a small cost involved for the men's breakfast, but a great way for the guys in our community to um, enjoy um, some conversations together. And I think they've got a speaker there as well. So thanks very much, everybody. Dan's got some extra announcements for us. Thanks, Emily. Uh, My name is Daniel. I'm the senior minister here. Um, uh, We've been talking a lot. I don't know if you noticed this. We've had a few announcements the last few weeks that seem... Uh, fairly big shifts for us as a church. Um, As many of you know, we became uh, an independent Anglican church at the start of last year, partnering with the other Life Anglican churches, but we've been moving towards further independence. Last week I mentioned we're processing the new name, uh, New Light Anglican Church, which we're in the process of working through. Uh, we also mentioned last week that we're setting up, we're moving to our own online database system rather than a shared one. And so our team hub, uh, if you have, if you know what that is, if you've been on our Alvanto system before, then you might know what I'm talking about. But our rosters, a lot of that stuff goes out through that way. Um, you see on the screen, uh, 28th of August, everyone who was on the old system had a login, should have received an invite to the new system. Um, We've been spending a bit of time kind of helping people connect with that. This coming Sunday, we are trying to move completely over to that. Um, And so this is great news for me because I've been working on it since January and I'm happy to see that finally take that step. Um, But it it does mean a few things. Uh, If you think you need access to that or you didn't get an email, uh, Bruce is going to be at the back of the service at the end of the service with a laptop and uh, he, will, um, he will be able to set you up, theoretically. Uh, theoretically, because him and I have to make sure he's got all the access he needs for that. But uh, we should be able to put your username in, put in a password and set you up on the spot. And so if you don't think you received that email, if it didn't work for you, today's a good day to talk to him after the service and get that final step hooked up. If you don't know what that is, there's a good chance, like unless you're receiving roster reminders through it, you don't need to worry about it and you can just let that go for now. 
um, you will if you will receive roster reminders if you're logged in or not, and uh, we can pursue that down the track if you need it. I have one more um, fairly large announcement, very large announcement actually for us as a church. I mentioned two weeks ago that uh, uh, one of the big challenges we will face as a church, I think one of the biggest challenges we'll face as a church over the next two years will be eventually running out of space in this room. If you've been around here the last few years, you'll know we have done many things to expand our space. We've knocked out walls. Uh, and each time we do that, when we first do it, it feels like, oh, there's more room than we will ever need. And then before we know it, we're out of room again. Uh, and we're running out of walls to knock down. And so we will have serious considerations there. And most of the things we will need to consider will require significant energy and uh, resources to, to process that. Um, what that means is we've been working through a very difficult decision for our church, and that is the future of our evening service. Uh, we started a conversation with our evening service a couple of weeks ago. Um, we haven't had a chance to kind of talk to the whole church about it. We wanted to talk to them first, and then there's been Father's Day and other things. Uh, and the process has been about uh, pausing our evening service <coughs> for a time and merging that service in with our 10 o'clock service here. Uh, the main reason is uh, two, two sides of this. One is incredible gospel opportunity we're seeing at our 10 o'clock service uh, and uh, in our area, uh, really uh, significant. And equally, we have not seen that kind of opportunity with our evening service. Uh, over the course of the year this year, there's been, for example, there's only been seven Sundays that we've actually had a visitor come to that service and almost entirely kind of out of town family members coming to that service. So there hasn't been a great opportunity to connect with people. Um, and so the long term reason we want to think about this is resourcing this service as much as possible for the next couple of years to face and push through whatever growth barriers we might need to to overcome our limitations. The short term reason we want to consider it is because uh, we're not seeing the gospel opportunities at the evening service. Every roster that currently runs our evening service has someone from the morning service helping out on every single team. And so it's a it's a um, it's using up resources to keep running it. And we were happy to do that. But we see other things coming on the horizon that we think we need to focus on. A couple of things that means for us then. Uh, one of them is the question of when. Uh, we were expecting this to happen closer to the end of the year. Uh, we wanted to process it, talk about it, talk about timeline. The initial conversations with everyone we've had a conversation with with the evening service has been that uh, all but one person is able to give the 10 o'clock service a go. And that has sped up our timeline. We felt like if that's what people are willing to do, then we will do it sooner rather than later. So the bottom line is uh, we're going to try to uh, finish up that service in just two weeks is what we're looking at. What that means for us here, many things. One is please join in prayer for that service. We love everyone who comes to that service. Uh, we want to care for them well. Two is... This is not a stop the evening service. This is a merging of two congregations together. Just happens that your time slot doesn't change. Um, and so uh, we want to bring uh, people from our evening service into this service, help them feel part of the community and be on board uh, together, uh, a family on team together. And so that's what we're doing. And so that will involve you to some extent in the next couple of weeks, um, welcoming people from that service. Uh, yeah, so those are those are things we're processing. The last question, I think, is what are we doing kind of long term with our youth, young adult ministry? What does that look like? One, what do we do with people that can't come to a morning service and is looking for a night service? As I said, it, it suggests that there's not a huge number of people in that category. They certainly haven't been showing up to that service. So, um, that's a fairly small number of people, we think, in this area. Um, we thought kind of young couples getting their first home might be interested in a night service, um, but most of them are thinking about family planning, 
and it seems like most have wanted to come straight to a morning service and that's what we've seen. Uh, what, are, what are we doing with our youth and helping them find their place in church for the rest of their lives? A night service is um, often one of the best mechanisms we can use to try to help kids that have grown up in the church find their own identity. Um, we are committed to having that ministry and we want to be committed to relaunching. It's not a stop, it's a pause for our night service. In the next few years, we want to relaunch it. How will we relaunch it? Well, we are expecting that a large number of our current youth will be at an age significantly that we might have a core group to relaunch it uh, with others, but also with them. What does that mean? So tonight is gate crash, and gate crash is the youth are involved in the service, get a chance to be on the platform, do different things. Uh, we want to think about this. We've got to work it out, but we want to do more of that at this service. So not quite sure what that looks like, but occasionally at this service, we'll be inviting our youth to be a little bit more involved on the platform, on the teams. And so we'll think about what that might mean as far as kind of replacing that, what currently happens twice a term at our night service. So it's a, it's a pretty big deal. It's a very big deal for our night service congregation. Uh, we want to love them well through this. We want to be praying for this process uh, and we want to be welcoming them as we merge two congregations over the next month. Uh, I'm going to pray for that before we continue in prayer for other things. Lord God, we thank you that you call us into family and we share family with one another. We share family across our congregations at our church. We pray, Lord, for this uh, huge transition for our evening service and the massive impact that is and, and the difficulty it will be for some to connect into a morning service and attend a morning service. We pray, Lord, that we might love every single person at that service well, that we might be able to help them find a place um, that they can continue to grow in the gospel. Uh, we pray that they will feel loved uh, despite the changes that are ahead. Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, we, we will continue to see your work go forward in a loving way. Amen. Cheers, mate. Well, we're going to pray. My name's Vish. Um, I was really struck uh, by this psalm, Psalm 147. And it says, praise God. And I don't really feel like praising God at times. I don't know about you. Um, I want to put the Christian mask on and say everything's all good, but uh, I think this morning God just shifted my heart through worship, just to see that I'm his child and I get to worship him. And so I'm going to pray, um, and, uh, and we're going to do that together. Let me pray, yeah? Um, Father, we, uh, we just thank you for another day to sing truths about who we are because of who you are. Um, we want to thank you that we are your children not because we're really cool or have tons of money or say real cool stuff, um, but that we're wretched and that we offer sin as our, way, as our means of being in your family. We've got nothing to offer but filth. And you say that that qualifies us to be forgiven. It qualifies the holy son of God to humble himself, to be born of a human, to be lower than the angels, to be dying on a cross and to fulfill your good plan of our sin in exchange for your life and for new creations to be birthed in our heart and in our mind that we really get to live out your good, your pleasing, your perfect will, that we get to have a sense of peace and joy, not because of what we've achieved, but because we hook into your family, Lord, and it's just by your grace. And you tell us, and it's even by your grace that we're saved and you give us faith. This faith is a gift from you. So we can't boast in any stuff that we do, but the hope that we have in you. And so, Lord, because we are safe in you, you tell us to praise you. You, you tell us in uh, Psalm 147 that at your command, hail enters this world. At your command, the fields become green. At your command, the birds get fed. And at your command, you kept your promise to Israel, to your people, sharing your word and what you are like. And man, we're just beneficiaries of that. We just, we just want to say thank you, Lord, for that. Um, Lord, we just pray for our church 
Uh, Lord, we, we pray that we'll be a people who would trust you beyond what our eyes can see. With our night service, you tell us in Romans 12 that uh, we're not ourselves, but we're actually part of your body, your special people. And you tell us to live our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. Not to be conformed by the patterns of this world, but to be really reshaped, Lord. And we want to be a people that look like you, your kindness. So other person centered. And so as we think about this service that's shifting and changing, Lord, we want to be a people who are sacrificial, people who look like you, Lord, that we might be welcoming our brothers and sisters, that we might serve one another, that we might pursue your good, your pleasing, your perfect will. Um, Because we're not better because we're at 10 a.m. and awake before the night service. Uh, Lord, we're your people. And we, we get to celebrate you because we are your children. And, and you do a wonderful work in us. You cause us by your spirit to see that we are your children, to see that we are in desperate need of our Father daily. And we get to praise you. We get to serve. Lord, the reality is that you are worthy, you are holy, and we are, man, we're so needy, Lord. There's so much stuff that goes on in our hearts and our minds. Um, Lord, we, just, we really pray um, for this church that we might be a light to this city, that we might show and share what you are really like, a good father who commands the wind and the waves and throws hail and snow and causes the ice to melt, according to this psalm, uh, the one who keeps his promise from long ago and continues that today. Uh, Lord, we pray that this church might be a church that seeks your will, that shares with a flood of love what you are really like both to each other inside the church but also those people who are not yet knowers of your goodness and your kindness Lord, we'll be a church that follows you no matter what Uh, and lord despite the situations that go on in our families our relationships even with our brothers and sisters here Lord, we're going to choose to believe that you are doing something new in our hearts that brings unity and glory to you and, and and that we get we're beneficiaries of your joy because you are doing something now and so we pray father will we taste and see that you are good will we sense your lightness as you take our burdens Um, and lord we just want to trust you with our relationships our marriages father our children you tell us that we're invited to this banquet by your grace so temper our hearts lord if if we think we know more than we ought then please humble us by your grace And Lord, if we think of ourselves unworthy due to our identity, Lord, please continue to garden our heart and pull out those weeds and replace those with deep truths about who you are and who we are because of what you say. Lord, we want to choose to believe that you are good. And so we pray, Father, would you help us in our unbelief as a church? Um, Would you help us in our unbelief, Lord, as we look at the world and think of its abuse of power in relationships, hurt of people who are innocent right around this world. And Father, would we choose to, to, to trust that you are a God at work in the mess of this world? Father, it's true because you did that in us. And so give us faith to believe beyond what we can see. That's what your spirit does. And so we ask, would you do that? in our hearts now would you do that in the people who might be suffering in the relationships that we either perceive from afar or feel near in our heart would you would you do something lord because we know you are up to that father there is there is so many needs um, but lord we just want to experience a real newness and freshness in our relationship with you um, so that we can choose to trust that there is no other god like you that we can choose to trust that we really are your child and we can fall in line with what your psalm says that there is no other way to delight in you but to praise you and we ask would you do that for your glory and for our joy and we pray this in the mighty name of jesus amen Well, good morning, everybody. It's time to read the Bible together now. So I invite you to open your Bibles or your Bible apps. We'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through to 25. If you're new or visiting us this morning, you might have been given a Bible on your way in, and and that's yours to keep. 
And if you're new to reading the Bible, you'll find a contents page at the beginning and Hebrews is towards the end of the New Testament. So reading from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through to 25. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshippers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, Look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. For Christ, first Christ said, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, Look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honour at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember the sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him, for our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without, a, without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Great, thanks, Amy. Good morning, everyone. If we haven't met before, I'm Miles. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's preaching time, so let's pray together. Father, thank you for not leaving us in the dark, but showing us who you are through the Lord Jesus and through your word. So help us now, not just to listen, but to take in what it is you have to say. Would you please change us and expose us and challenge us? And would you please refresh us and comfort us and strengthen us and heal us? Amen. What is the most secure building that you have ever entered? You know, the one with the most security checks or that needed the highest swipe card access. Maybe inside was a very important person or something very valuable or something very dangerous. What's the most secure building you've ever entered? My dad worked as a railway signalling engineer, uh, which is awesome. I was means I was obsessed with trains as I was growing up. 
And as you can imagine, when it comes to directing very large, heavy pieces of metal moving at high speeds with people inside, there is some high security, some complicated protocols when it comes to train signals. When I was younger, he took me to a remote signal box, which just means it's not manned 24-7. And to get inside, you needed this special key that couldn't be copied. And before you could do anything, you had to disarm all the alarms, otherwise nothing would work. And that's because inside was something dangerous. If you got in and did the wrong thing, it could be a disaster. But signal boxes are not the most secure building my dad has ever entered. Uh, one time he was in London for a conference, and he was chosen as a part of a small group to go and visit the Houses of Parliament, where the Prime Minister is, where the PMs are. You might have heard of Guy Fawkes, the 1605 gunpowder plot. Guy Fawkes and his friends wanted to assassinate King James I and say they were going to blow off the Houses of Parliament. That's the building where my dad was invited to. And so you can imagine, it's, it's secure. There's bag checks, there's questions, there's metal detectors, there's guards with guns. And my dad had come straight from the conference with his backpack, and in his bag was a knife. Not because he's a psycho, don't worry, but because when you're at conferences, people give you like branded things, right? You know, the, you get the water bottle, the pen, the hat, whatever it is. And someone gave my dad a branded pocket knife, which he put in his bag and he forgot about, and then he walked into the Houses of Parliament. You know, the high security building, famous for being targeted by political assassins with the Prime Minister inside with armed guards. And so the knife was found by my dad the next day because they didn't find it. All the security checks, all the metal detectors, the arm guards, and they missed it. And I really wish I could have shown you it today, but my dad forgot about it a second time when he was getting on the plane to come back to Australia, and the airport security were more competent, and so I can't show you. But this is the picture we have in our mind, right? The Houses of Parliament, Buckingham Palace, the White House, Fort Knox, nuclear power plants. These are the places that are the most secure, and yet they don't even come close to the most secure place, the place with the highest security clearance, the, where inside is the person who is the most important, who is the most valuable, the most dangerous, and you only get swipe card access if you're perfect. This is standing before God in his presence in his throne room in the most holy place. In the Old Testament, sometimes people came close. You know, Moses was once in God's presence, like kind of. God said to Moses that my glory is going to pass over you, but if you look at me, you'll die. And so Moses hides and he catches a glimpse of the back of God's glory, but he doesn't see his face. Isaiah was once in God's presence, again, kind of. He's in God's throne room, but the train of God's robe fills the temple. And so Isaiah's not looking at God, he's looking at his robe, and he falls down and trembles before him. The high priest went into God's presence once a year, again, kind of. In the middle of the tabernacle or the temple, there was a little room, the holy of holies, the most holy place, and there's a thick curtain covering the entrance, and that's where God was most present on earth, like a God hotspot. And if you went inside, you would die. And once a year, after all the preparations, the high priest was allowed to go in and make a sacrifice. Just have a look at your Bible. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. It's on the screen as well. And so... Dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. The most secure place in the universe, high voltage, danger of death, watch out for lasers, keep out. Moses hid. Isaiah trembled. The high priest got one chance a year, and we 
can boldly enter. Not covering our eyes to catch a glimpse, but with eyes wide open. Not trembling, worried that we'll melt before him, but confident that we are welcome. Not one person once a year, but anyone who follows Jesus anytime. We can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. It's a monumental shift, isn't it, from the Old Testament, what was happening then to what happens with us now. And so let's, let's look at this shift together and then we'll draw out the implications that the author of Hebrews makes. Throughout the book of Hebrews, as we've been seeing, we've been looking at how Jesus is greater. And since chapter 7, the author has been explaining how Jesus is the greater high priest and the greater sacrifice. And chapter 10, verses 19 to 22, is like the crescendo. Think of your favorite action movie. Uh, the music director uses a crescendo, builds the music up at the main point, the huge moment, the plot twist, the final battle. And that's chapter 10, verse 19 to 22. After four chapters of explaining and unpacking and drawing all these threads together, these verses just unleash the glorious and seemingly impossible reality that because Jesus is the greater high priest and the greater sacrifice, we can boldly and confidently approach God. Let's, let's see it together. Have a look at your Bible. We'll just start in chapter 10, verse 1. And here we're talking about the Old Testament sacrificial law. The cost of sin, of rebelling against God, is death. The wages of sin is death. Which means there's only one way that there can be true forgiveness, and that is if blood is shed. Here it is, Hebrews chapter 9 on the screen. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so, God set up a sacrificial law system where his people would sacrifice animals, an animal would die in their place, so that their sins would be forgiven is, is what you might think was happening. But that's not right. That's not how it worked. Because in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, it's very clear that animal sacrifices can't forgive sin. In fact, what they do is almost the opposite. Verse 3, they remind people of their sin. Animal sacrifices didn't forgive sin, remove sin, take it further away. They brought sin closer, right in your face. It was a reminder, look at this animal. This is the consequence of your sin. This sacrificial law couldn't forgive sin. It was incomplete. Or to use the language of verse 1, it was just a shadow or a dim preview. When I was in primary school, my sister and I would always want to watch the morning cartoons, cheese TV, but uh, my parents were very wise and they did not let us watch TV before school because we were useless at getting out of bed and leaving the house on time. But we loved it so much. We loved watching Dragon Ball Z so much that every morning we would get a video, chuck it in the VCR, make sure it was rewound, and we would record the morning cartoons. And then when we get home, we would get there, get changed, get a bowl of cereal, sit down, watch Dragon Ball Z, and we'd watch it together. And it was awesome. Every day, pretty much. And after every episode of Dragon Ball Z, there was this short teaser for the next episode, just 30 seconds. It'd always say, next time on Dragon Ball Z, which is exactly how it sounded. And then it'd be just 30 seconds. And it's so exciting. Wouldn't it be just silly for my sister and I to be satisfied with the teaser and then just not bother to watch the next episode. That would be silly. And in a similar way, the sacrificial law was just the teaser. It showed glimpses of what was going to happen in the next episode. That's all it was. And then along came Jesus. The sacrificial law was the teaser. Jesus is the full episode. The sacrificial law was the trailer. Jesus is the movie. The sacrificial law was the sign, you know, KFC, 10 kilometers, best sign in the world. Jesus is the restaurant. 
Jesus takes the Old Testament category and he expands it and blows it up and then he fulfills it. And the author of Hebrews, he explains what that expansion and fulfillment looks like throughout the rest of these verses in verses 5 to 18. And the key verse is verse 9 for you to have a look at. It says that Jesus cancels the first covenant, the first agreement, where animals were sacrificed over and over again to remind people of sin. He cancels that one in order to put the second covenant into effect, that Jesus would be sacrificed once to forgive people of sin. Here it is on the screen just to help put it together in a comparison. This, this is all this language taken from verses 5 to 18. Animals were sacrificed by the priests again and again to remind people of their sin. Jesus was sacrificed as our high priest once for all time to forgive people of sin. You see, teaser and episode, trailer, movie, sign, restaurant. Jesus is greater. He's the greater high priest. He's the greater sacrifice. And you know, once Jesus is done, verse 12, he sits down because that's what you do when the job is finished. And so with all that in mind, we get back to verse 19. Brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. And verse 20, the curtain barrier between us and God has been opened. We can go right in. We can boldly approach the Father and be with him because of what Jesus has done. Our sin is completely removed and dealt with and forgotten, and our guilt is washed away, and we're free, and we're unburdened, and our future is secure for eternity. We have a place at his banquet table. Where Moses hid, we get to look. And where Isaiah trembled, we get to stand. And where the high priest waited, we just get to go in any time. If you follow Jesus, this is our reality that underlines every season and every circumstance and every moment. This is the glorious reality that through Jesus, we are with God and we can boldly approach him. We have the maximum security clearance. And if you don't yet follow Jesus, this can be your reality. Today, you can experience the full forgiveness of sins and cleansing of guilt if you put your trust in Jesus. Let's draw out some implications from this. Hebrews was written to some followers of Jesus who were suffering and they were struggling. And so throughout the letter, there's full of warnings and encouragements. You know, warnings, watch out, but encouragements, keep going. And that is exactly what we find here in verses 23 to 25. The author's just finished describing this incredible reality that we can boldly approach God. And so it makes sense that the first thing he says after is, I want you to know this and experience it. I want you to stick with Jesus and reach the end. And so what he does is he highlights three currents that are trying to move us away from Jesus. This is a picture that we saw earlier in the book of Hebrews. God's promises are an anchor to hold on to. And our enemies, the world, the flesh, the devil, are like ocean currents trying to move us away from the anchor. The world being our culture that stands against God, the flesh being our sinful hearts that do what we want and not what God wants, and the devil being the devil who is real and active and a sneaky liar. And the world, the flesh, the devil are trying to move us away from Jesus, push us and pull us and draw us away. There's a famous moment in the book, Through the Looking Glass. It's the sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And here it is. Alice is running with the Red Queen, running as fast as she can. But she notices that the trees next to her don't seem to be moving at all. 
And so they stop running to take a break. And here's the conversation they have. Alice looked around her in great surprise. Why, I do believe we've been under this tree the whole time. Everything's just as it was. Of course it is, said the queen. What would you have it? Well, in our country, said Alice, still panting a little, you generally get to somewhere else if you ran very fast for a long time, as we've been doing. A slow sort of country, said the queen. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. It's a famous moment, so famous that it's known as the Red Queen Theory or the Red Queen Syndrome. It's used all the time in business and leadership and science, and this is the idea that standing still is falling behind. And if you want to stay in the same place, you've got to run. And the reason we talk about it here is that it's very relevant. If you follow Jesus, but you coast, you relax, you drop your guard, then you will drift away from the anchor. The world, the flesh, the devil will move you. And so you need to run just to stay in the same place. You need to cling to the anchor just to stay near it. And so here are the three currents that the author of Hebrews highlights. Here they are on the screen. We're being pulled away from Jesus. We're being drawn towards ourselves. And we're being pushed apart from each other. Three constant current in our lives that we need to notice and fight against. Three constant currents that we need to run against just to stay in the same place. Let's look at each one. Verse 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. The world, the flesh, the devil are trying to pull us away from Jesus. And the encouragement is, hold tightly without wavering. There's two ways that our enemies will like to try and pull us away. One is just slowly and consistently wearing you down over time. And the other one is suddenly and violently catching you off guard and dragging you away. Which is why the encouragement is to hold tightly without wavering. Clinging to Jesus, even if everything seems calm, because maybe a storm is coming. And you know, maybe today, this is the encouragement that is resonating with you. This is the encouragement that the Holy Spirit is bringing to your heart. Maybe your hands are just tired and you feel like your grip is slipping, or maybe you're looking around and suddenly you've noticed that you're a lot further from the anchor than you remember. Or maybe you've noticed that you're coasting and that following Jesus just kind of seems easy and what's the big deal? Or maybe the world's attitude of just doing whatever you feel like looks pretty attractive right now and the flesh is telling you just to let that sin out and just enjoy it. And the devil's saying that that sin is not even that bad anyway and God will just forgive you, so why does it matter? Whatever it is, in the words of Hebrews 12, 12, take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Don't listen to yourself. Yourself doesn't know what it's talking about. Preach to yourself. Affirm the hope that you have and convince yourself and remind yourself and pray for strength and take a new grip. Because of Jesus, we can boldly enter God's throne room and so hang on to him like your life depends on it because it does. Second one, verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. The world, the flesh, the devil are trying to draw us towards ourselves. I'm the most important. And the encouragement is love others and do good works and motivate each other to love others and do good works. My first piano teacher used to say that practice makes perfect. You heard that saying before? What a load of rubbish. What a terrible thing. That's not true. It doesn't mean that at all. 
What a terrible way to try and motivate a child, because they'll never get there. My second piano teacher was much better for a lot of reasons, and one of them is that she used a different saying, practice makes progress. You can take it, you can use it, it's yours. Far more realistic and far more motivating. Because we need motivation when something is difficult or it feels unnatural or it seems unimportant. You know, 10-year-old Miles practicing his piano scales over and over again, they were hard, they were difficult, and they felt unnatural the way I had to move my fingers and they seemed unimportant. I just wanted to play other things and so I needed motivation. And in a similar way, loving others and doing good works can also feel like those three. It's difficult. It's time and, and energy and resources, and people are complicated. And it can feel unnatural. It might take me out of my comfort zone. And it can seem unimportant, especially if no one sees you doing it or says thank you. And, you know, the world and the flesh and the devil, they love to piggyback on those feelings. You know, our world is convinced that I should make myself number one. And it says it so loudly. The volume is turned up. Such a strong push for individualism. And my flesh is really happy to go along with that because being number one sounds great. And the devil's just cheering them both on from the corner because they're doing a good job. But followers of Jesus love each other and do good works. That's what we do. It's not optional. It's not just for premium subscribers. It's basic. It's standard. It's every follower of Jesus. It's James chapter 2 that faith without deeds is just dead faith. Followers of Jesus, we don't just look towards ourselves, but we look to Jesus and to others. That's just who we are, and that's who we are becoming. And so we need to motivate each other because it's hard. Here's three ideas for you to help motivate each other. The first one is that you can lead by example. One way to motivate other people is to do acts of love and good deeds yourself. Second one, you could start serving here at church or consider increasing your serving, whether it be on Sunday or during the week. That's a simple way to love others and to do good deeds. Or third one, you could be the person who helps us build a culture of thankfulness in our church. You could be the one that notices when someone does something and you can tell them and you can thank them for it. Three ideas. And so maybe today, this is the encouragement that's resonating with you. This is the encouragement that the Holy Spirit is bringing to your heart. Because of Jesus, we can boldly approach the Father, and so we need to do what he says and fill our lives with acts of love and good deeds and motivate each other to do the same. And number three, verse 25. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now, that the day of his return is drawing near. The world, the flesh, the devil, they're trying so hard to push us away from each other. And the encouragement is, don't neglect meeting together, but encourage one another. One of the highlights of mine every week is that I get to teach scripture at Riverson High School. And one of the questions that comes up at least once a term is, do I need to go to church if I become a Christian? And seeing as it's something I'm asked all the time, I think I've refined like a clear, short answer. And so here it is. You can tell me what you think. One day, every person is going to stand before God, and he gets to decide whether or not to let you into heaven. And the question he'll ask won't be, did you go to church? Yes, you go to heaven. No, you go to hell. That's not the question that he'll ask. The question that he'll ask is, did you follow Jesus and trust him to forgive your sin? That's the question. And so then, no, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Being a Christian has everything to do with following Jesus and trusting him. However, imagine you're a part of a family but you never turn up to the family gathering. You never turn up to the family lunch. Something's wrong. 
there's some dysfunction in that family, with your relationship in that family. And in a similar way, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a part of God's family, and if you never turn up to church, the family gathering, then something's wrong. That's a red flag. There's some dysfunction in your relationship with the family. Followers of Jesus go to church. That's what we do. One place we see that is Hebrews 10.25, and followers of Jesus are the church. That's who we are. And one place we see that is in 1 Corinthians 12. And so if you follow Jesus, then yes, you need to go to church. That's my answer. You can tell me if it can be even more sharpened afterwards. And P.S., the follow-up question is usually, can you lie and just tell God that you did trust Jesus when you didn't actually? (laughs) And the answer is, no, you can't fool God. What I'm keen to say today is what was clearly said to me when I started following Jesus in year nine. If you follow Jesus, then you should be here at church every week unless you have a very good reason not to be. That's what was taught to me in year nine, and that was helpful for me and forming for me, and I think I've taken that advice pretty well. You know, what is a very good reason to miss Church, sometimes it's really easy. If you're sick or you have COVID, then don't come. Of course, that's a very good reason. But if you're tired because you scrolled Instagram till 1 a.m., then you should come. That's not a very good reason. But often it's much more complicated than that. How should you decide? You need to use your wisdom about whether you should come or not. But you just need to remember that the world and the flesh and the devil are trying to push you apart from your church family. They want your poor reason to seem like a very good reason. Let me give you an example. In the book, The Screwtape Letters, every chapter is a letter from like a senior experienced demon giving advice to his apprentice demon who's trying to pull away his patient from Jesus. And in one chapter, the senior demon is very frustrated to hear that the patient is attending the same church every week, even though he doesn't love everything about the church and he doesn't love everything about the people. And the senior demon says, it would be so much better for us if he didn't go to church at all, but also it would be so much better for us if he noticed how dissatisfied he was with church and went looking for a different one that was perfect for him. And that picture is exactly right. The devil wants you to miss church, to minimize it, to downgrade it, to push you apart, or just as good for him, he wants you just like to notice all the flaws and notice all the piano player's mistakes and notice that the preacher is a bit long and boring. And then just how you're not that satisfied and maybe you should go looking somewhere else where everything works for you, which you'll never find anyway. And so when you're using your wisdom, just remember that the world, the flesh, the devil, they're working against you. They want your poor reason to seem like a very good reason, and you'll need to be very wise to figure that out. And so you should be here. You should be here at church every week unless you have a very good reason not to be. And and why? What's the reason? I mean, there's lots of good reasons. I mean, it's commanded here in Hebrews 10. That should be good enough. But let me say the one that the passage says. You should be here at church every week for the sake of others. That's why. So that you can encourage them, especially because Jesus is returning soon. Never underestimate the ministry of turning up. Your mere presence in the room is an encouragement to me and to others, and it's even more so when I hear you sing, and when I watch you, and you're praying, and you're reading, and you're listening, and when we talk afterwards. And your mere presence in the room is also an encouragement to the children in our church. Not just your children, if you have them, but all the children. Because you all know this. There's a lot of teachers in the room. Children are very clever, and they notice things. And they notice whether this is important or not. 
And so if we want our explorers and our jungle and our youth students to be in church every week when they're older, then, then it begins now. And of course, it works the other way around as well. In the same way that you encourage others, you will be encouraged yourself. And so maybe today, this is the encouragement that's resonating with you. This is the encouragement that the Holy Spirit is bringing to your heart. Because of Jesus, we can boldly approach the Father. And so do not give up meeting together. For the sake of each other, you should be here unless you have a very good reason not to be. Three currents to notice and to fight against. We're being pulled away from Jesus. We're being drawn towards ourselves and we're being pushed apart from each other. Standing still is falling behind. We need to run just to stay in the same place. With that in mind, how about we pray and ask God for help? Father, thank you again for your word. And thank you that you speak to us through it. And thank you for your spirit and for the way he works in us. And we ask that whichever encouragement he has helped us resonate with or whatever next step he has put in our heart, that we would have the courage and the clarity to hold that encouragement closely and to take that next step quickly. Amen. All right, we're going to stand and sing our final song this morning. So why don't we do that together? And reflect on the words from Hebrews, the truth. It says to us that we can boldly approach God through the sacrifice of Jesus. How cool. Let's start. Set your heart upon the cross Never know the sacrifice you made and all our sin and all our shame You took the nails and took our place And no one else could do what you have done Cause one name is high And one name is stronger than any grave, than any throne, is Christ exalted over all. From the grave where death would have died, He rose again and brought us life. You're reigning now, the Savior of the world.
longer for coffee and morning tea. If you were handed a welcome card on your way in, please give it back to the person who welcomed you. Um, they may not be wearing their blue vests anymore, or you can put it in the black box up, up the back, which is also where if you want to make a cash donation to spreading the good news of Jesus through our church, you can do it through that way or online. So please stick around. Thank you. Thank you. 